the android dropped the device and with a snarl grabbed with both hands for Rick's throat. As the android's hand sank into his throat, Rick fired his regulation issue old style pistol from its shoulder holster. The 38 Magnum slug struck the android in the head and its brain box burst. The Nexus 6 unit which operated it blew into pieces, a raging mad wind which carried throughout the car. Bits of it, like the radioactive dust itself, whirled down on Rick. He found himself struggling to shove the twitching remnants of the android away. Shakily, he reached for the phone. He placed a call home. His wife's face, sodden with a six-hour depression, manifested itself on the vid screen. Oh, uh, hello, Rick. What happened to the 594 I dialed for you before I left? Pleased acknowledgement of... I redialed as soon as you left. What do you want? I'm so tired and I just have no hope left of anything. Of our marriage and you possibly getting killed by one of those Andes. Is that what you want to tell me, Rick? That an Andy got you? Listen, can you hear me? I'm on to something. A new type of android that apparently nobody can handle but me. I've retired one already, so that's a grand to start with. You know what we're going to have before I'm through? I ran stared at him sightlessly. Oh. She said, nodding. He could tell now. Her depression this time had become too vast for her even to hear him. I'll see you tonight. He finished and slammed the receiver down. Damn her. What good does it do, my risking my life? I wish I had gotten rid of her two years ago when we were considering splitting up. I can still do it, he reminded himself. Broodingly, he leaned down, gathered together his crumpled papers, including the info on Luba Luft. No support, he informed himself. Most androids I've known have more vitality and desire to live than my wife. She has nothing to give me. That made him think of Rachel Rosen again. Her advice as to the Nexus 6 mentality, he realized, turned out to be correct. Assuming she doesn't want any of the bounty money, maybe I could use her. Snapping on his hover car's engine, he whisked nippity-nip up into the sky, heading toward the old War Memorial Opera House where, according to Dave Holden's notes, he would find Lou Beluff this time of day. He wondered now about her, too. Some female androids seemed to him pretty. He found himself physically attracted by several, and it was an odd sensation, knowing intellectually that they were machines but emotionally reacting anyhow. For example, Rachel Rosen. No, he decided, she's too thin. He could do better. How old did the poop sheet say Luba Luft was? Twenty-eight, the sheet read, judged by appearance which, with Andy's, was the only useful standard. I'll try one more Andy before I ask Rachel for help, he decided if Miss Luft proves exceptionally hard. In the old opera house, Rick Deckard found an echoing, noisy rehearsal taking place. As he entered, he recognized the music, Mozart's The Magic Flute. On the stage, Luba Luft sang, and he found himself surprised at the quality of her voice. It rated with that of the best, even that of the notables in his collection of historic tapes. The Rosen Association had built her well, he had to admit. At the end of rehearsal, Rick made his way backstage. Stopping a super, he asked for Miss Luff's dressing room. Rick arrived at the indicated door, saw a note tacked to it reading, Miss Luft, private, and knocked. Come in. He entered. The girl sat at her dressing table. She still wore her costume and makeup. The stage makeup enlarged her eyes. Enormous and hazel, they fixed on him and did not waver. Yes, she said. I am busy, as you can see. Her English contained no remnant of an accent. You compare favorably to Schwarzkopf, Rick said. Who are you? I'm from the San Francisco Police Department. Oh? The huge and intense eyes did not respond. What are you here about? Seating himself in a nearby chair, he unzipped his briefcase. I have been sent here to administer a standard personality profile test to you. It won't take more than a few minutes. Is it necessary? I have a good deal I must do. It's necessary. He got out the void comp instruments, began setting them up. An IQ test? No. Empathy. I'll show you some pictures and ask you a few questions. Meanwhile, he got up and walked to her, and bending, pressed the adhesive pad of sensitive grids against her deeply tinted cheek. Do you think I'm an android? Is that it? I'm not an android. I haven't even been on Mars. I've never even seen an android. Do you have information that there's an android in the cast? I'd be glad to help you, and if I were an android, would I be glad to help you? An android, he said, doesn't care what happens to another android. That's one of the indications we look for. 
then, Miss Luff said, you must be an android. That stopped him. He stared at her. Because, she continued, your job is to kill them, isn't it? You're what they call a bounty hunter, but I'm not an android. Let's get on with the test, he said, getting out his sheets of questions. I'll take the test, Luba Luff said, if you'll take it first. Again, he stared at her, stopped in his tracks. Wouldn't that be more fair? She asked. Then I could be sure of you. I don't know, you seem so peculiar. You wouldn't be able to administer the void comp test. It takes considerable experience. Now please, listen carefully. These questions will deal with social situations which you might find yourself in. What I want from you is a statement of response as quickly as you can give it. One of the factors I'll record is the time lag, if any. He selected his initial question. You're sitting, watching TV, and suddenly you discover a wasp crawling on your wrist. What's a wasp? A stinging bug that flies. Oh, how strange. Do they still exist? I've never seen one. They died out because of the dust. Don't you really know what a wasp is? You must have been alive when there were wasps. That's only been... Tell me the German word. He tried to think of the German word for wasp, but couldn't. Your English is perfect, he said. My accent is perfect. It has to be for roles, but my vocabulary isn't very large. Vesp, he said, remembering the German word. Ach, yes, I'm Vesp. And what was the question? I forgot already. Let's try another. You are watching an old movie on TV, a movie from before the war. It shows a banquet in progress. The entree, he skipped over the first part, consists of boiled dogs stuffed with rice. Nobody would kill an eated dog. They're worth a fortune. But I guess it would be an imitation dog. But those are made of wires and motors. They can't be eaten. Before the war. I wasn't alive before. But your response, he said. I want your social, emotional, moral reaction. To the movie? I turn it off and watch Buster Friendly. After a pause, he said. You're dating a man and he asks you to visit his apartment. While you're there... Oh, nine, I wouldn't be there. That's easy to answer. That's not the question. Did you get the wrong question? But I understand that. Why is a question I understand the wrong one? Aren't I supposed to understand? Nervously fluttering, she rubbed her cheek and detached the adhesive disc. It dropped to the floor, skidded and rolled under the dressing table. Ach, Gott. She muttered, bending to retrieve it. A ripping sound, that of cloth tearing, her elaborate costume. I'll get it, he said, and knelt down, groped under the dressing table until his fingers located the disc. When he stood up, he found himself looking into a laser tube. Your questions, Lubelov said, began to do with sex. I thought they would. You're not from the police department. You're a sexual deviant. You can look at my identification. He reached toward his coat pocket. His hand, he saw, had begun to shake. If you reach in there, Lubelov said, I'll kill you. You will anyhow. Let me see some more of your questions. She held out her hand and reluctantly, he passed her the sheets. In a magazine, you come across a full-page color picture of a nude girl. Well, that's one. You became pregnant by a man who was promised to marry you. The pattern of your questioning is obvious. I'm going to call the police. A few minutes later, during which Luba carefully kept the laser tube on him, a large harness bull arrived in his archaic blue uniform with gun and star. All right, he said at once to Luba. Put that thing away. She set down the laser tube and he picked it up. He returned to Rick. Who are you? He came into my dressing room, Luba left said. I've never seen him before in my life. He pretended to be taking a poll or something, and he wanted to ask me questions. I thought it was all right, and I said okay. And then he began asking me obscene questions. Mm-hmm. Let's see your identification, the harness bull said. I'm a bounty hunter with the department, Rick said as he got out his ID. I know all the bounty hunters, the harness bull said as he examined Rick's wallet. And I've never heard of you. He handed Rick's ID back to him. Call Inspector Bryant, Rick said. There isn't any Inspector Bryant. It came to Rick what was going on. You're an android, he said. Like Miss Luft. Going to the vidphone, he picked up the receiver himself. I'm going to call the department. He wondered how far he would get before the two androids stopped him. He dialed. Let me talk to Inspector Bryant. This is Rick Deckard. A pause, and then Harry Bryant's face appeared on the vid screen. What's doing? he asked. Some trouble, Rick said. One of those on Dave's list managed to call in and get a so-called patrolman out here. I can't seem to prove to him who I am. He says he knows all the bounty hunters in the department and he's never heard of me. He hasn't heard of you either. Let me talk to him. Inspector Bryant wants to talk to you. Rick held out the vidphone receiver. Officer Krams, the harness bull said. Hello? 
He listened and said hello several more times, then turned to Rick. There's nobody on the line and nobody on the screen. He pointed to the vidphone screen and Rick saw nothing on it.